Thanks for checking out this online resource. We here at Calvary Community Church hope it's a help to you in your own spiritual journey. But online resources can't replace our engagement with the local church, where we can serve with others, we can worship with others, we can do life together and reach out to the community. If you live near Calvary, we invite you to join us 6 p.m. Saturday or 9 or 11 Sunday morning for one of our weekend services. If you live at a distance, just email us at info at calvarycc.org and we'll help you find a church where you can get grounded and growing in Christ. Now, you may have come in here and uh, maybe in a situation where you're feeling pretty desperate. There seem to be no options for you in the circumstances you find yourself in. You really don't know where to turn. You don't want to do. You're really in a desperate place. Probably the most iconic imagery of someone who is in a very isolated, remote, desperate place is someone stranded on a deserted island, right? Well, there's a guy who was stranded on a deserted island for a uh, number of years, all alone. He sees some planes. Every now and then he sees a boat in the distance. But one day as he's standing on his little deserted island, he looks out over the horizon and there's a boat coming right at him. And he can see a figure in the boat. And so he just yells from his little island, boat! And he's so excited. This is the end of his desperation. What he doesn't know is that the guy on the boat is looking at him on the island and he's yelling, land! because he's been desperately adrift for months and has been looking for any land. Maybe you're like the guy on the boat or you're like the guy on the land, but you feel you're in a desperate place. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. Maybe it's something to do with your health or someone you love, a family situation, something going on in your dating life or your marriage, something you're experiencing at your job, but you feel like you are in a desperate place. We're going to be looking back into the book of Jonah. If you want to turn there to Jonah chapter 2. We're actually going to begin with verse 17 at the end of, of the previous chapter, chapter 1. And uh, you can go there in your hard copy of the Bible. You can go there on your mobile device. But we'll be in Jonah chapter 2 primarily looking at these 10 verses. And we're going to see Jonah in the belly of this great fish. He is in a desperate place. And sometimes when we're in a desperate place, we just want God to change our circumstances or our situation. Sometimes God doesn't change your situation because he's trying to change your heart in what you're going through. And Jonah is in a place that really has him at a loss. It's not what he expected. It's not what he thought was going to happen when the sailors on the boat threw him into the sea. As we look at Jonah chapter 2, and we, we're going to look at Jonah's cry, his prayer to God from the belly of the great fish. I want us to understand this this morning. When you are in a desperate place, God wants to do more than get your attention. He wants to change your heart. In Jonah's case, I think he only gets Jonah's attention, but Jonah doesn't allow him to change his heart. Even as we read this prayer... You'll understand and you'll see that Jonah is outwardly conforming to what God wants him to do, but he is not allowing himself to be inwardly transformed. You remember we looked at chapter 1 last week. God comes to the prophet Jonah in the middle of the 8th century, and he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, and preach a gospel to them. I, I am going to allow those people to repent and experience my grace, mercy, and love. And Jonah, being an Israelite, knows how cruel and wicked and evil the people of Assyria are. This is the great kingdom of the day that has hurt the people of Israel. And these were torturous barbarians. And he's looking at it saying, wait a minute, they have nothing to do with you. Why would you show them your grace? I'm not going there. So instead of going 500 miles inland from Israel to the east, he goes or sets off to go 2,500 miles from Joppa, which is modern day Jaffa in Israel, across the Mediterranean, going through the Straits of Gibraltar, over around the corner to where there is an area of land where the borders between Portugal and Spain meet. And he plans to go the opposite direction of where God has. He's going as far away as he possibly can. But he gets out on the boat, big storm comes. The sailors, these pagan Phoenician sailors who are very experienced, don't know what to do. They're in a panic. And finally, they figure out Jonah is the cause, and he tells them, if you want to get rid of this storm, just throw him into the water, and the sea will be calm. So they pick him up, and they throw him into the water, and blub, 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 down goes Jonah. And he goes in thinking, this is the way I'll finally escape God. I'll just die, and he can't send me to the Ninevites. 
He's got a strong bias. He's got a spirit of judgmental uh, criticism toward them. And much of it was justified, justified in terms of their sense of justice or morality. They were far from anything that God expected of his children. But now Jonah is sinking in the Mediterranean. And we pick up verse 17, the last verse of chapter 1 of Jonah. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now some uh, might want to challenge the, the science of this. And, and if this is possible, uh, we could go to stories of people who have been swallowed by great fish or whales and been cut out and alive after hours or days and could go to all of that. But here's what it is. It goes back to what Pastor Brian Howard said several weeks ago about the story of Noah and the ark. If I can accept that God created the universe, then this is nothing for God to prepare a specific fish that can swallow and hold Jonah for three days and three nights. If God can raise his son from the dead, then this probably isn't even in the top 10 miracles of the scriptures. But we do know he's in the belly of this fish three days and three nights. Now, scientists tell us the temperature in there is going to be between 105 and 115 that he's going to be experiencing the stomach acids of this fish. So he's going to be bleached over. His eyes are going to burn. His lungs are going to burn. His hair is going to get bleached. His skin is going to get lesions and sores and is going to be bleached in these three days and three nights. And if you have the image that, you know, some cartoons have shown of Jonah or images where he's just walking around the belly of this whale or this great fish and he's made a fire and he's just camping out. And that's not how this was. More than likely, scholars believe he would not have been able to even move his arms as the stomach of this great fish would have been constricting him. And also, this would not be a great experience in terms of breathing and the other uh, dying, rotting fish. And so this is going to be a place that's hard to breathe. It's going to smell like a septic tank. Not a pleasurable experience. Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. We've got to stress the then there. In the Hebrew, there's something very clear about that then in the original language. Jonah does not pray during the three days and three nights. At the end of three days and three nights, Jonah prays. Talk about a stubborn, wayward prophet. You're in a fish's belly and you're going to wait three days and three nights and then cry out. And then he just takes a few minutes to say this prayer. And we get to verse 10. The fish vomits Jonah up on the dry land. Maybe he didn't have to stay there three days and three nights if he would have prayed to God and reached out to God. First, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, now here's Jonah's prayer. It is a prayer of outward compliance, but a prayer that does not invite inward transformation. So we're going to learn from what Jonah does say, which is good. But we're also going to learn from what Jonah doesn't say. We need to go further than what Jonah does in his cry to the Lord. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths. I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves giving us a little of his experience. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. Now wait a minute. God drove him from his presence? Go back to chapter 1. Jonah's trying to run from God's presence. He says, I'm going to look to your holy temple. Why the holy temple? The temple in Jerusalem in the Old Testament was the place where the intimate express presence of God dwelt. Now, yes, God is present everywhere, but God can make his presence known. And he made his presence known in the tabernacle first and then in the temple. And so they would look to the temple for that intimate personal expression of God's presence. Now, in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus ripped the veil so we can have access to God's presence. And when we put our faith in Christ, we're given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then is the intimate express presence in us. And therefore, each one of us all of us, we are temples with the presence of God in us. When you came into this place, the intimate express presence of God was not here when this room was empty at three this morning. But when God's people come in, this becomes the gathering of God's people and the intimate express presence of God comes with you in the presence of the Holy Spirit. But he says, I'm going to look to your holy temple. This is his cry. 
I sank beneath the waves, verse 5, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I'm reading from the New Living Translation because I think it captures the emotions and the drama and the expressions here. This, this last word, head, in the original is right below my head. It's the idea of my neck. Seaweed is wrapping around him as he's sinking to the depths of the Mediterranean. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I'm right at the bottom of the sea. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates locked, locked shut forever. This doesn't sound very good. He thinks it's over. This is what he thought was going to happen. I'm done. I'm dead. But you, O oh Lord, you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. There's a little irony here, isn't there? He is snatched by the jaws of a great fish that snatches him from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remember the Lord. So three days and three nights, it appears he's losing consciousness. He feels it. He's about to die. Then he remembers the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. I prayed to you, to your very presence. And then verse 8, which by the way, if you underline or highlight, which I encourage you to do in your Bible or your mobile device, mobile app of the Bible. This is the key verse of the entire book. It helps you understand Jonah's hatred and disgust and why he will not go willingly to the Ninevites to preach for God. Verse 8, those who worship false gods or idols turn their backs on all God's mercies. He's saying, look, the Assyrians, these, these horrible people, they have rejected you and they've gone their own way. They don't deserve your mercy, your love, and your grace. And that's an attitude he's had that drove him to go in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. It's the attitude that's brought him to the depth of the sea and now into the belly of the fish. And even as he outwardly complies and he's vomited from the fish, he goes into chapter 3 and 4 as he goes to Nineveh and then watches what God does in Nineveh. He still wants God's judgment to fall. His heart doesn't change toward these people. He only outwardly complies. By the way, this verse also is at the very center of the book. There are 24 verses before chapter 2, verse 8, and there are 23 verses after chapter 24, verse 8. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. There would have been general vows he would make as an Israelite, but then there were vows prophets made. And so, and so he's saying, I will do what I'm supposed to do. I'll go to Nineveh. And then he says, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Boy, that's a true statement. Not just his salvation from the belly of the fish, but his salvation and our salvation before God. Pastor and author J.D. Greer says there were three kinds of people in the world. So there'd be these three kinds of people in this room. He said there are irreligious people who when it comes to salvation, a right relationship with God, forgiveness with him, they believe they don't even need it because there might not even be a God. If there is a God, they don't care. They don't want to have a relationship with him. So irreligious people say, that doesn't matter. I don't need salvation. You may be an irreligious person here saying, I'm here for my mom, my dad, or I just showed up with my girlfriend or whatever, and I, I don't have any interest in these things. And you might say, I don't need salvation. There's a second category of people that, uh, that Pastor Greer points out, and he calls them the religious people. These are people who believe that salvation comes from themselves. Sometimes there are people who go under the banner of Christian who follow this idea too, that somehow, somehow I'll be good enough, religious enough, I'll go to church enough, I'll give enough, I'll be kind enough, I'll be a good neighbor, I'll be a good parent, I'll be a good spouse, I'll do all these things, and then I will be good enough that God will say, I forgive you, you may enter into my heaven. But the problem is, we can never be good enough, and as Greer says, we can never be God enough. We'll always fall short. I will fall short. You will fall short. The best person you can think of will fall short. But, but, there is a third category of people, and those are biblical Christians. People who understand the scriptures say we cannot save ourselves, but we do need salvation, and salvation alone comes from the Lord through his Son who died, was buried, and rose again for us. And when we put our faith in Jesus, in Jesus alone, God saves us and makes us right with himself. Now, where do you fall in this? Are you irreligious saying, I don't need salvation? Well, I got news for you, you do. One day you'll stand before the God who made you and you have to give an answer for your life. And if you stand there in your own merit, in your own philosophy, you will not be saved. Are you a religious person saying, well, I'm going to get there and say, God, look at all that I did. Look at all that I did. Look, that's what I was trusting in. 
That's not gonna work either. So when we come to the point where we say, okay, there's nothing I can do, it's what Jesus did, and salvation comes from the Lord alone through his son. Put your faith in Jesus today. See your need and recognize salvation comes from the Lord alone. If I can help you, I'll be in the lobby after the service. Our care and prayer team are down here to pray for you about that or to answer any questions you might have about what it means to find salvation alone in the Lord. And they're also here to pray for you if you're in a desperate place and you feel all boxed in and constricted with the circumstances of your life. And you want someone just to pray with you after the service. Jonah then, after he says, for salvation comes the Lord, experiences relief from this fish, verse 10, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah, many translations say, vomit Jonah out onto the beach or the dry land. He comes out as one who is outwardly conforming, but he is inwardly the same. He has not been changed, and that carries out in chapters 3 and 4 when we see the rest of his experience in his relationship to God and the Ninevites. Well, today I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you. I want us to see what we can glean from his prayer, what's missing in his prayer that we can also learn from. And first, I want us to notice that when God has your attention, you surrender yourself to his will, his control. You submit to him when he's got your attention. However you got into those circumstances, through your own fault or the fault of others or the natural consequences of life, in that desperate place you're in, God wants to not only get your attention but change your heart. But as he gets your attention, it will cause you to surrender yourself to him. Then you'll notice four things when he's got your attention. To, to know that he's got your attention, you'll, you'll see three or four things that will be true of your life. Number one, if he's got your attention, you sense his presence. You sense his presence. Verse two, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead and Lord, you heard me. He's saying, you were with me in this spot. You were with me in this place. I cried out to you, and you met me inside the belly of this fish. Maybe you feel like God has forgotten you in that desperate place. He's with you. You just need to open up and talk to him. And As he's gotten your attention, notice and sense his presence in your life. Someone has put it this way, you're safer with God in the middle of a storm than you are anywhere else without him. Another angle on that same thought is safety is not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. We spend a lot of time trying to rid ourselves of any dangers in life, and we think that's where there's going to be safety and peace, but there's safety and peace when we are aware of God's presence in our lives and we look to him no matter what our circumstances are. And then Jesus put it so simply and so sweetly as recorded in Hebrews 13.5, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, period. If you're God's child, if you've received Christ as your savior, guess what? He's with you wherever you go. He says, I will never leave you. And we need to sense the presence of God in our lives. Yes, he's with us, even in the belly of the fish, even in the most desperate of locations. Secondly, when God has our attention, we'll not only sense his presence, but then you recognize his providence, his divine control, that he's weaving all the details of your life and the circumstances of your life together to, to get your attention, to have the opportunity to transform your heart. In verses five and six, Jonah cries out, I sent, excuse me, verse three, Jonah cries out, you threw me into the ocean depths and I sank to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. You've been in control of this all along, God. I see your hand, your sovereignty, your providence in all of this. When God has your attention, you sense his presence, you recognize his providence, but then you notice his protection. How even though you're in seemingly greater danger, inside the belly of a fish seem more dangerous than in a boat on top of the sea, but you sense his protection in your life. Verses five and six, I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. I, I was about done and you protected me. 
When you're in that desperate place, just to stop and say, well, I've got my life. I've got my God. He's protected me and kept me to this point, even in the midst of this financial crisis, this marriage turbulence, this struggle of health. You have protected me. And then fourth and finally, when God has your attention, you accept his plan. Verse 9. Jonah cries out, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows even to go to Nineveh, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Okay, God, I will mark the box that I have complied. I will go, and I will do what you've told me to do. You've got my attention. I've now surrendered to your will, to your plan. That's not easy for some of us. Some of us are control freaks. I'm a bit of a control freak. A lot of times... I'm trying to control the variables of my life. And Jonah was doing that when he got on that boat, right? And he's going the other way. Then he says, instead of turning the boat around and going back, he says, throw me in the sea. He still wants control of all the variables of his life. But in the belly of the fish, after three days and three nights, and probably for three days and three nights, he's been trying to control the variables there. And he finally says, all right, you have my attention. I surrender to your plan. I've done that before in my life with things with even where the Lord wants me to go and serve. When Leslie and I got married, we said we would serve the Lord anywhere in the world. We didn't know if that meant we'd be missionaries, we'd be a pastor. We didn't know what that meant. We didn't know where we'd go, what our life would look like. She grew up in Indiana. I grew up, or excuse me, I grew up in Indiana. She grew up in Maryland near Baltimore. And we met in college in West Virginia. We loved the people there. But both of us got a lot, uh, we had a lot of troubles with getting motion sick because of the windy roads of the beautiful mountain state of West Virginia. And so as we graduated from from uh, college, and we got married, went off to seminary in the D.C. area, we said, all right, Lord, we'll go anywhere in the world but back to West Virginia. <laughs> because we just can't handle the, the kind of roads we're dealing with. We can't handle that kind of stuff. We'll go anywhere but West Virginia. Then we were there. The Lord picked us up after seminary and a little stint in Pennsylvania, sent us to West Virginia for almost 15 years of ministry and service. <laughs> Lord, remember, we said, not West Virginia. So after a number of years there, uh, we were here visiting in Southern California in February of 2008, came to a funeral of uh, someone that we knew from back east that had moved out here years ago. And while we were at that funeral down in Orange County, we said, you know what, we've got an extra day. Let's drive up to the Reagan Library and visit. We saw there were great views and all that and just wanted to visit there. So we drive across LA to the Reagan, Reagan Library this is February 2008. We drive back down. We experience all the traffic of LA. And on our drive back in the middle of the traffic, I said, you know, the Lord could send us anywhere, but not California, not Southern California. <laughs> Seven months later, I was the pastor of Calvary Community Church. So now I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, we do not want to retire. There is no way after we're done with ministry at Calvary, we want to retire in Maui. No way, Lord. We will not. We will not go there. You know, often we want to control all the variables. Jonah's been trying to do that. But God wants to get our attention. He wants us to sense his presence, to recognize his providence, to notice his protection, and then to submit to his control and his plan. You know what that means? That means we get on our knees. If you're in a desperate place, the first thing you do is you get on your knees. Jonah does this. We commend him for that. And he prays. And, and the, the reality is that when you are surrendered to God's will, you get on your knees before him. That's when he's got your attention. And some of you perhaps need to get back to that point. Maybe you've been like Jonah, you've been waiting a long time, three days, three nights in the belly of your desperate place, and you haven't just gotten on your knees and prayed. In that desperate place, have you gone to your knees yet? Has he got your attention? That's a good thing. It's a good thing Jonah prays this way. But what doesn't he pray? That's important for us to hear as well. And we can see it in chapters 3 and 4 that there is no real heart change to this prophet. He still doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Even after Nineveh repents and turns to God and they experience God's grace and mercy, he doesn't like it in chapter 4. So there's more to what God wants to do with us in a desperate place than just get our attention. He wants to take us from that place and really transform who we are at the core. 
The second thing I want us to notice, it's not even here in Jonah's prayer, is that when you abandon yourself to God's love, he changes your heart. What do I mean by abandon yourself to God's love? When you understand it, and you are basking in it, and you are swimming in it, and you are, are grateful for it, and you understand it, and you're trying to put your heart and mind around this measureless, awesome, amazing grace of God, and you experience that kind of love even in a desperate place, then God begins to transform you from the inside out. In verse 8, Jonah says, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. As I said, this is the key verse in the book of Jonah because it helps you, even from the fish, to understand his view has not changed. His perspective on these people is still the same. They are evil, wicked people who don't deserve God's mercy. And this word mercies here is one of, the, one of my favorite words in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word, Hebrew word chesed, and it means continuous, unending, faithful love. See, Jonah's been experiencing that, even being in the belly of the fish. God had preserved him and protected him. But he doesn't think these people deserve it. I don't know about you and how you view other people. Maybe you look at someone on the opposite end of the political spectrum as you, and you have a lot of criticism and a lot of, uh, of judgment against them. Maybe you look at someone who's younger or older. You look at the opposite gender, or, or you look at people who are living certain ways in this world, or you look at a, a homeless person, and you say, wow, they wouldn't be there if, and you have a critical spirit toward people around you and people in different circumstances, and it's hard for you to say, I could love love that person because I know why they are where they are and what they're doing and I don't like it. Well, how do we allow God's heart and his love to change our hearts and the way we love? Well, you'll know he's changing your heart. The one sign of that will be you love him because he first loved you. You love him because he first loved you. We weren't smart enough to come up with the idea that we will love God and then maybe God will love us or we'll stack up enough good stuff and meet God part way. The Old Testament law proves that can never happen. And that's why the New Testament says that while we were still sinners, guilty before God, God demonstrated his incredible love to us in that he sent Jesus to die for us. And John would express it this way in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. And when you experience his love and then you love him, something happens that transforms your heart and how you relate to other people around you. Even those who've hurt you, business associates that, that have burned you, an ex-spouse that has hurt you deeply, a, a former boyfriend or girlfriend who, who just tore your heart apart or I don't know who it is or what it is. and Maybe it's something you see on TV or you hear in the news that gets you angry at a certain group of people. Or maybe it's even more personal than that. The beginning of really having your arms open to other people and showing them love and having a transformed heart, even for Jonah, it doesn't happen anywhere in this book, is where we receive the love of God because he first loved us. We experience the love of God and then it begins to change our outlook. So secondly, as he changes your heart, you see people the way he sees people. Not the way you see people, or a political party sees people, or the common thinking of the world sees people, or people tell you how you ought to see people, but you see people the way he sees people. We're often looking at the outside and we miss the reality of what's going on in their hearts. Even those awful Ninevites, he looked at the outside, but each of them was a lost person in need of a God who would love them. 1 Samuel 16, 7 would give us insight into how God sees people compared to how we see people. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We need to start thinking about who that person is at their very heart, not just their actions, their attitudes, their behaviors, how they treated us, how they wronged us. But we need to see people as he sees people. Every human being you come in contact with, Jesus died for, because God loved them. Now, let me just encourage you to take this assignment this week. This week, notice the people around you, not just your family and your friends and the people you relate to normally, but when you're in line at a store, notice the people in front of you and behind you. 
notice the people when you're stuck in traffic and the car is next to you. Don't stare too long. That is weird in traffic. <laughs> but just glance at them. And whether they're older than you, younger than you, they have the same color of skin as you, they come with the same ethnicity, they wear the same kind of clothes, whether they frighten you or they encourage you when you look at them, just notice those people in the other cars and in line and in the waiting room at a doctor's office or some of you might be going to the airport sit at the gate there's plenty of time there and just look at the people and every person you say just say to yourself Jesus died for him Jesus died for her God loves him God loves her when you see people on TV that just irritate you and maybe they speak from a different uh, political perspective than you stop and say God loves him God loves her you said I don't want to do that I kind of like the hatred I have towards certain people and the biases and the prejudice when you're being like Jonah. He said, well, I'll do what I have to do, but I'm not going to let God change my heart for these people or those people who've wronged me. And you're missing out on, on what Jonah missed out on. And as you travel with us in the next few weeks through the rest of the book, you're going to see the misery. His final words in this whole book are, just let me die, God. You don't want to be there. See people the way he sees people. Thirdly, when he changes your heart, you love him because he first loved you. You see people the way he sees people, but your heart breaks for what breaks his. Jesus, coming down the Mount of Olives, stops part of the way down where he can see Jerusalem sprawled out before him. And this is the city of David, the, the, the shining city on a hill. But he knows that they have time and time again rejected God and, and even killed God's prophets and so he cries out in Luke 13 34 Jerusalem Jerusalem you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing you are rebellious you killed the people I sent to speak to you to point you in the right direction and I've been so broken I've wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wing and take care of you, but you wouldn't even come under the wing. But the text there in Luke 13 says he weeps over that reality because he's moved with compassion for these people. Then when he's traveling in the rural areas of villages and towns, Matthew tells us this about Jesus moving about in the villages and towns in the rural regions of of Israel when he saw the crowds Jesus when Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion on them it means to be moved deeply because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd I hope this week is you see people as God sees people made in his image for whom Jesus died God loves then your heart will break for what they're going through does your heart break when you hear about a person becoming a widow or a widower? Does your heart break when you are introduced to an orphan? Does your heart break when someone is in need and can't even get a meal for themselves or a place to stay? Does your heart break for people struggling to make it in this world? Does your heart break for people who are caught up in greed and selfishness and pride? Does your heart break with people caught up in sexual immorality? Or do you just look at them with a judgmental spirit? They have chosen their idols, their false gods. They've turned their back on God's mercy and that's it. Our hearts should break with what breaks his. We should see people the way he sees people. It's all because he first loved us. Fourth and finally, when he changes your heart, you extend mercy because he extends mercy. You extend mercy because he extends mercy. Mercy is God withholding the judgment we deserve. How can he do that? Well, Jesus took the judgment on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. I, Sean, deserve an eternity separated in judgment from God. And by the way, not just me, you do too. We all fall short of the holy God who made us. But God so loved us, he sent Jesus. And now when we come to him in faith, not only are we saved by his grace, where he gives us what we don't deserve, the goodness of Christ on our account, but we are saved by his mercy. He withholds the judgment we deserve. 
And look at how that mercy is described in, in the Old Testament prophet Micah, the book of Micah 7.18. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Something Jonah never experiences anywhere in this book is the delight of showing mercy to people who don't deserve it. And he misses out on a great blessing. And I don't want you to miss out on a great blessing. I think the news of our day, the various voices shouting at each other, that division we often talk about, it shouldn't be a part of the believer's life. Because we should be people who, wherever we come from, whatever political spectrum, we are extending mercy to people. And if you see people the way God sees people, and you have a heart that breaks with the things that break his heart, and you have experienced the love of God, then you have abandoned yourself into the love of God so much that then you will extend mercy because he extends mercy. You know, we talk about the gospel, but there are some super complicated things about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that anyone can come to Christ and be saved. I told you the story years ago. I visited Angola prison in Louisiana, one of the bloodiest maximum security prisons in the United States, filled with murderers and rapists who will never get out because of the laws of Louisiana. And I was taken there, and I was there for an event with uh, Awana Clubs International, and I... Uh, I was taken by a warden into death row. And these are some of the worst of the worst. And they've got individual cells and they barely get out of that cell. They go into a little cage that's outside and gives them about nine square feet all caged in so they can't get out. As we're walking, the assistant warden says to me, that person we just passed, um, he was a serial killer picked up in New Orleans a number of years ago, killed at least seven people brutally, probably more, waiting to die on death row. We kept walking and we passed a cell with a little short elderly man, just a kind looking diminutive stature person, grandfatherly type. And he walks over to the bars and he just looks at me and he says, do you know Art Rohrheim? Well, Art Rohrheim was the founder of Awana and Art had been coming every year to this event that was taking place at the prison to reunite kids of the prisoners with their dads for one day. And and I said, I know Art, he's a friend of mine. He, he looked at me through the bars, he's a friend of mine too, is he here this time? I said, no, he's sick, he couldn't make it. He said, would you tell him that I'm, I'm now moving up and I'm close to being one they're gonna execute for what I did, and would you tell him I'll see him in heaven? I thought, that's great, you're gonna see him in heaven, that's wonderful, and I said, uh, when did you come to Christ? And he said, Art led me to Jesus so many years ago here in this very cell, and it's helped me grow in Jesus. I said, it's great. We talked together. We prayed. And then I went back to the room I was staying in. And I decided I wanted to Google this man's name and what I knew about him. I Googled. And then I read about the crimes he committed. And I won't go into detail. But he brutally tortured over days and murdered his six-year-old stepson. Quite frankly, he did things to that boy that are described as what the Ninevites did to their enemies. And as I'm sitting there seeing what he did, something welled up in with me that there's no way he can be going to heaven. Then something else came up that said, wait a minute. The mercy of God goes to anyone who comes to Jesus. And some of you are going, I don't like that gospel. Jonah didn't like that gospel either. But that gospel that saves me, saves anyone from whatever they've done. When Jesus died, the punishment of what that man in that cell did to that little boy was poured out on Jesus. And you say, well, I don't like that. That, that. that just bothers me. That burns me up. It burned up Jonah. But there's real joy, real satisfaction. When you're not only surrendered to God's will because he's got your attention, but because you've abandoned yourself to his love, he's changed your heart. Even toward people, it'd be very hard for you to ever forgive. Personally, in your own life, or people who you put in a certain category that that's just unforgivable. No one's in that category to God. And as God's people, we should be people who extend the love of God. You see, yes, when we have surrender to God and he has our attention, we go to our knees in prayer. 
But when we've been abandoned to his love, he changes our hearts, then our arms are open wide to others, to everyone, with the love of God, the very love he's loved us with. When you're, when you're abandoned to God's love, you'll open your arms to others, even when it's uncomfortable. This isn't what Jonah experienced, but it's what we can experience as God's children. You see what Jonah was missing? Don't miss allowing God to change your heart. Be abandoned to his love, not just surrendered to his will. When you're in a desperate place, God wants to do more than get your attention. He wants to change your heart. We just ask you, have you gone to your knees before God in that desperate place? Have you prayed, cried out to him? Jonah did that. That's a good thing. Maybe you need to do that today. You've been wrestling with this, trying to control the variables. It's time to get on your knees and say, God, I'm in a desperate place. Have you opened your arms to others? Have you truly abandoned yourself to the love God has for you and for others? Are your arms open to other people because of how open God's arms have been to you? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just talk to the Lord right now. If God's spoken to you today about someone you struggle to forgive or a group of people that you have animosity toward, and maybe it comes from your background, your upbringing, your political perspective, your own issues, just ask God to help you to love them like he's loved you. Maybe it's very personal, someone who hurt you desperately that God has brought to mind. Let the Holy Spirit work in your own heart. And then commit to going out of this room, to live in love like Jesus, to see people the way he sees people, to let the things that break his heart break yours, to extend the mercy he's shown you to others. Commit before God now in this moment God, I want to leave with arms open wide to show love to others around me every day and to see people the way you see them. Father, thank you for the example of Jonah. Thank you that he went so far to outwardly comply, but we pray that we'd go further than just getting on our knees and saying, we'll do what you tell us to do, but may we love you, and as we love you and experience your love and abandon ourselves into your love, may we love others the way you've loved them even in that desperate place. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.